Welcome to mini lesson two in the zoology of excitons mini course. This time I want to talk about excitons in a particular material called molybdenum disulfide that's been an important optoelectronic material in about the past decade. It's depicted here in this picture. So today what I want to do is introduce to you the key discoveries related to single layer molybdenum disulfide, in particular how we understand direct versus indirect optical transitions and the effects of quantum confinement on photoluminescence. And then what I want to do is apply the hydrogenic model to both bulk molybdenum disulfide and single atomic layer molybdenum disulfide. Uh, and the reason for doing that is because it's really not particularly straightforward. We're not just going to plug into formulas, we're going to start by plugging into formulas and then sort of iterate back and forth with more sophisticated studies and um, to see, you know, how to adapt our hydrogenic model to real materials. And so molybdenum disulfide is this shiny, flaky, almost graphitic stuff. It's basically weakly bound layers of uh, molybdenum in the center, sulfur on the outside. They're, they're weakly bound together, so you can sort of peel them off with scotch tape. And you can peel them down to a single layer that's just a sulfur, molybdenum, sulfur, trilayer almost. And so this is the paper from 2010, so more than 10 years ago now, that really broke open the field and pointed out that atomically thin MOS2 is fundamentally different than the bulk MOS2 material. So this is Mac et al. in Tony Heinz group. And so Mac and Heinz are still heavily involved in this field. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the band structure of MOS2. As we know in the hydrogenic model, eventually we're gonna need band structure to get reduced mass. And so we'll be talking about that in just a second. But first I wanna tell you the big observation that they made, which is that single lem layer MOS2 is really bright in terms of its fluorescence intensity. And so you just imagine taking a laser, say a green laser, shooting it at a sample, the sample absorbs the green laser and re-emits light typically at a different wavelength. Um, and so if you do that, this is just a microscope image of a little exfoliated flake of MOS2 that's two layers on this black spot and one layer on the gray spot. And if you put a filter in so that you're only seeing the fluorescence light, the photoluminescence wavelength instead of all the light, you see that the only place that's bright is the single layer part. And if you do a spectrum, you see that there's a huge photoluminescence peak at like 1.9 electron volt photon energy in the single layer piece, but not much luminescence at all in the two layer piece. I mean, if you zoom in here, you'll find a little peak. And so this photoluminescence essentially intensity is strongly dependent on layer number. I mean, it's actually much more complicated than the photoluminescence quantum yield, but that's not a topic for today. So this is a major observation. You know, for a while since the discovery of graphene uh, in 2004, people have been thinking about 2D materials, and this is really the first time that, you know, 2D materials came into the realm of op optical activity, interesting optical properties, in the visible anyway. So let me just quickly remind what is photoluminescence. Basically, it means uh, light that we get from the so-called radiative decay of excited states. And so what happens is we have incident light that's, say it's some wavelength green that can create an excited state from the ground state. Uh, and then the excited state can re-radiate light, typically of a different wavelength than the initial incident light. Uh, so that's just sort of the simple process. What, to get a better idea of how this actually works and especially why the uh, wavelength of the emitted light is most often not even close to the wavelength of the incident light, we should look at this on a special diagram that shows energy levels as a function of some generic, uh, we'll call it a reaction coordinate 
characterizing, say, atom-atom distances in the ground state versus the excited state. So you could think of it as like an almost like a near neighbor distance, I guess. Um, and so in this picture, the energy as a function of this particular atomic coordinate Q is parabolic near the ground state minimum and also parabolic near the excited state minimum. But when you absorb the incident light, you make a vertical transition from the minimum of the ground state into some off minimum point on the excited state parabola. And then on very, very fast time scales, the geometry of the excited state, namely the value of Q, relaxes towards its minimum. Right? It lowers its energy until it gets to the minimum of this excited state parabola. So that's the new geometry of the excited state, and you would reach that on time scales of, you know, picoseconds or less. And then at that point, you can de excite back down to the ground state. Um, emitting a photon that now has a different wavelength or color than the incident one. And in particular, uh, yeah, the energy of the excited state should be typically lower. Not always, but typically. So to talk about MOS2, we need to also introduce another perspective on transitions in a solid and we need to go back to the band structure picture so what I just showed you was something like a real space picture with that with that atom spacing coordinate on the horizontal axis and now I'm showing K the crystal momentum and so a direct band gap is one for which the excitation is vertical in EK space namely it occurs for Delta K equals zero and this is the strongest, the most likely type of transition to occur, either up or down. Uh, and it's because it can occur via the absorption, or alternately the emission, of a single photon with the involvement of nothing else. Right? <clears throat> and so direct band gap transitions are going to have very strong absorptions and emissions. And another way to say that if you're into quantum mechanics is that there's a large matrix element for the transition. So by contrast, it's possible that the lowest energy gap in the material occurs between a position in reciprocal space for which delta k does not equal zero. So you might have to move horizontally as well as vertically. And in this case, it can't happen solely by the absorption of a single photon. It must be assisted by uh, scattering with a phonon, a lattice vibration. <clears throat> and so in this case, because more than one particle is involved in the process, the probability of it happening is dramatically reduced, and indirect gaps have relatively weak absorptions, weak photoluminescence intensities. So this is the situation in molybdenum disulfide um, in a theory computation reported in Yaziev and Kiss back in 2015. On the top, you see the actual band structure of the bulk MOS2. And the lowest energy gap in bulk MOS2 occurs between the top of the valence band at the so-called gamma point, which is the k equals zero point of the Bruin zone, and about halfway to the k point uh, in reciprocal space. It doesn't really matter what all this notation means. It's just delta k does not equal zero, so it's indirect. <coughs> And so what happens here is as you start to thin down the bulk MOS2, you get quantum confinement effects. So basically particle in a box effects, whose main effect is to take this blue point and raise it higher and higher in energy while keeping everything else almost exactly the same. I mean, not the same, but the main one we should focus on is that this is going up. And in particular, if you look at these parabolas at the K point, they're pretty much staying fixed while well, this goes up, right? And so what happens is, as you go down to monolayer MOS2, this point has gone up above the minimum at the K point. So now the lowest energy gap is between the top of the valence band at the K point 
and the bottom of the conduction band at the K point, which is a vertical transition. And so you've gone in the bulk from having an indirect transition where everything optical is super duper weak to a direct transition where everything optical is super duper strong. Okay? And this is the big discovery about single layer MLS2 is that you can make a transition from a traditionally indirect gap semiconductor now to a direct gap semiconductor in a single layer. So what does this have to do with excitons? Well, this whole excitation process is definitely involving an electron and a hole. But how do we know we're seeing excitons? What are their properties? So let's first recall our gallium arsenide study where we said the signature that we kind of tend to look for in excitons is a sharp peak riding on top of a continuum background. All right. And so let's take a look at MOS2 and see if we can see that type of structure. So this is from the original paper from 2010. In this case, the black data is optical absorption and the red data is photoluminescence. And so if we just take a look at the absorption spectra, you can see these A and B sharp peaks in the black curves and maybe they're riding on a continuum background. It's not completely unreasonable to think so. To my eyes, it looks even more convincing in the one layer than the two layer. And so maybe we can assign these A and B peaks to excitonic features. <clears throat> and I think for today, I'm not going to distinguish be between the A and B excitons. Uh, maybe I'll bring that up later on uh, in a different lecture. And instead, I want to focus on the lowest energy excitonic feature, the A feature. I, which is actually only visible in the luminescence, is the indirect gap that's only present in the two-layer film and not the one-layer film. So rather than thinking about single-layer and bilayer like in the, in the big discovery in 2010, I want to talk a little bit about a paper uh, that was published a little more recently where they discuss exciton binding energies in MOS2 using a combination of experiment and theory. And so in the graph on the right, you can see an absorption spectrum near the A peak, where I think it's fairly obvious that you have a sharp peak riding on a continuum background. And the main point of this paper is to discuss what is the origin of the A star peak. Now, I'm not going to focus on that in my slides today. Um, initially in the literature, it was suggested that the A peak, which is subscripted with N equals one, was the N equals one member of the hydrogenic series and that the A star peak might be the N equals two. And one of the things that this paper does is to suggest that this is not the case uh, and that the origin of the A star peak is not uh, in the hydrogenic series. But again, that's, that's maybe a little bit more than I want to talk about right now. But what I first want to do is just take this data and sort of what we know about MOS2 band structure and just do a 3D exciton calculation, right? So let's just plug in we know from the band structure of MOS2 that the reduced mass is 0.23 M. <clears throat> Sorry. And can we just note that that reduced mass is quite a bit bigger than the reduced mass in gallium arsenide? So we really expect to have stronger exciton binding in this material than in gallium arsenide. Remember, reduced mass in gallium arsenide was like 0.0 something, quite small. Uh, in addition, we're talking about MOS2. To define a single dielectric constant value, we need to think about the fact that this is an anisotropic material for which the response of electrons in the plane of the sheets is very different than the response of electrons perpendicular to the sheets. And the way you characterize that by a single number is to assign to the effective dielectric constant the geometric mean of the anisotropic dielectric constants measured for the bulk. And so E parallel is in the sheet, E perpendicular perpendicular to the sheet, geometric mean of 8 and 20 is 
And so when we plug all these numbers in, we get an exits on binding energy of 20 millivolts. And so what, are we, are we done? I mean, not really. There's sort of no consequence to this as it stands right now. How do we understand if this binding energy actually makes sense? Is this, can we just look at the data and say, does it agree with the data? It's not so simple. So what we're telling, uh, what we're saying here is that, look, we can model the data as um, a, a sharp exotonic peak, 20 millivolts below a continuum uh, free electron band. And, you know, it's going to be hard to be sure whether that's right or wrong if you just sort of try to simulate it, I think. And so what you would actually do in this circumstance to try to figure out if this is right is you could take two approaches. One is you could say, all right, I've got an idea for a device that relies on exotonic properties, right? And I'm gonna design my device with this number in mind and then build the device and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I could blame this being incorrect. That's probably not a great idea. And instead it might be a better idea to try to contextualize this value, which is taken from a somewhat simplified model of the solid state uh, and contextualize it with more sophisticated studies, either experimental or theoretical computational. So let's see if we can do that right now. <clears throat> so in the paper Seigel et al. that I mentioned from 2016, what they do is they do a 3D model for exotonic physics and they get this red curve and they're sort of unhappy with that. And they're sort of suggesting that there's something wrong with aspects of the model when you demand that the excitons are perfectly three-dimensional. And instead, what they do is decide that the excitons are essentially two-dimensional, quasi-two-dimensional, because they're mostly stuck inside those sheets of molybdenum and sulfur. They add a little bit of extra band structure information to the calculation, and they find that 2D geometry plus extra band structure bits gives a pretty decent approximation to the full absorption spectrum in the excitonic region. And so what have they done here? They've essentially said, I think we're going to ignore the band structure pieces of their analysis and instead kind of focus on this distinction between 3D and 2D and what they've basically done is to say that okay exotonic physics is understandable except you have to think in 2D and that's further supported by more detailed computational studies from Molina Sanchez et al where they showed that the exciton wave function in bulk MOS2 is indeed strongly confined to a single layer it's not leaking into adjacent layers very much and so it's really quasi two-dimensional. So what's the consequence? The consequence is that the expression for the energy eigenvalues in two dimensions for a hydrogen atom problem, uh, uh, an electron bound to a hole, is different than in three dimensions. So in 3D, this was our formula for the energy eigenvalues. But in 2D, it's almost the same, except the denominator is modified with this factor of n minus a half. And so when you plug in n equals 1 to get the lowest energy state, so the one that will tell you the exciton binding relative to sort of the conduction band minimum or whatever, you get that the energy, the binding energy in 2D is four times the binding energy in 3D. And so if it's true that we have to consider bulk MOS2 as quasi two-dimensional, the 20 millivolt binding energy value is not correct. And instead, we need to model bulk MOS2 as quasi two-dimensional by multiplying this value by four. And so the binding energy would be 80 millivolts instead of 20. So again, how do we know we're right? I mean, we don't for 100% sure right now with what I'm telling you. Um, but if we go back and remember that the quasi two-dimensional picture was necessary to understand all of these details, then you start to see it. And I'll go perhaps even further and sort of suggest, well, let me not. <clears throat> um, 
and I think I think uh, we'll just keep going from here. So yeah, the and so the point here though is that I want to make is that given this quasi two dimensional nature of the exciton, the binding energy is eighty millivolts compared to twenty. That's really significant because twenty millivolts is less than the thermal energy at room temperature by just a touch. But 80 millivolts is quite a bit higher than the thermal energy at room temperature. 20, you know, 26 millivolts is the standard thermal energy at room temperature. And so this is a big difference in how you would think about designing devices and where your applications are going to be suitable, uh, whether you believe the binding energy is this weak or this strong. And so we can keep going with this and think about Bulk MOS2, we've put in some quasi two dimensional physics to get a stronger exciton binding energy. If we go down to single layer MOS2, we can keep our 2D expression for the energy eigenvalues. And now the only thing we have to do is to realize that if you're truly 2D, if you're truly down to a single layer, the dielectric constant is now extremely complicated. Um, and so dielectric constants for single layer materials may depend really strongly on what the materials are sitting on, what their environment is. But for the sake of argument, we take some values from, uh, again, the Seigal et al. paper, where they argue that the effective dielectric constant of a single layer is about 6.6. .6. So notably, it's lower than bulk, right? Because there's less material around the 2D thing to respond to electrostatic fields. And so you would expect the dielectric constant to be a bit lower, and it is. So it's qualitatively reasonable. And when you plug this in to the 2D hydrogenic model result, you get a binding energy that's now 290 millivolts. <clears throat> and so this is substantially higher even than bulk, right, which is already starting to be reasonably high. Uh, and this is um, a really important intuition that we tend to have about low dimensional materials and their excitonic physics is that as you reduce dimensionality you increase exciton binding energy and it's mainly because of this dielectric constant effect where a low dimensional material does a bad job at screening and so the electron and hole charges can now see each other more fully and so what we've done here is to look at MOS2 mainly from the standpoint of how we talk about the hydrogenic model in a in a sort of research relevant modern system and so in gallium arsenide we got away with the 3d hydrogenic model and we convinced ourselves that these are really Wanye excitons that are quite big in bulk MOS2 what we decided was that we needed to think about a quasi 2d hydrogenic model so you know same conceptual ideas but a little bit different formulas to account for the unique geometry of that material and also its strong anisotropy and dielectric constant i'm going to make the claim that that's still a wanye exciton and then in single layer mos2 we have true 2d instead of quasi 2d there's no real consequence to that we're using the same 2d formula whether it's quasi 2d or true 2d uh, but we do have to again you know, think carefully about how we're assigning our dielectric constant. And I think this is also considered Wanye, but it's an interesting exercise to ask how you would go about calculating the average radius of excitons in MOS2 using the hydrogenic model um, to see if they're really Wanye in your opinion, right? So you would go, maybe go through these slides and see what we did for the various energy calculations we did and kind of apply the same thought process to the average distance between the electron and hole. And so you can use the references in these slides to guide your discussion, and I would suggest that you look through them somewhat carefully, almost as an exercise in how you read a paper for research. So I'm asking you about radius of excitons, right? And so to do calculations about radius of excitons like you don't need to read every word of all those papers. You need to kind of filter through them and find the things that are important to you to do that calculation. And later, if you want to go back and read it, 
you know, that's that's fine. Maybe you're going to get something out of it. You know, maybe there are important points that should be discussed. But but in terms of like solving this problem and this exercise, you want to be selective and uh, and read uh, read what you need and not much more. <clears throat> so that might be something worth trying. Um, in the next set, in the next lecture, what we're going to do is talk about smaller excitons. We're going to move on to talk about materials that have excitons where the spacing between electron and hole is of order the lattice spacing. And these are going to be the Frankel excitons, and we'll see how their properties are different than Wannier ones. <clears throat>